Welcome to Hamilton's Vital Signs. I'm Terry Cook, and we're talking about issues that matter in Hamilton. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, education, and particularly, I want to focus a little bit upon something we're doing at the Hamilton Community Foundation called Abacus, which is a series of interventions focused on middle school years uh, for Hamilton students. And I'm particularly pleased to welcome to the uh, to the program two good partners in uh, in education in Hamilton, Dwayne Dahl from the uh, Boys and Girls Club and Leo Johnson from Empowerment Squared. Now, I always get to do this stream of consciousness kind of uh, made up impromptu thing as I start. So you guys came with some questions, but I'm not gonna ask those questions. I wanna start with uh, a little bit about each of your backgrounds and, and a bit about your uh, the organizations. Then we'll talk about how specifically you're assisting with getting kids post-secondary ready in Hamilton. And Leo, uh, let me start with you, because uh, you came here as a refugee from Liberia, and I want you to just Talk to me about how that happened and what sh how your experiences informed what you do today. Thank you, Terry. Um, it's very interesting given everything that's happening um, today. Mm -hmm. um, originally from Liberia, ended up on a refugee camp in 1998, mm -hmm. doing the bloodshed in Liberia at the time. I lived um, on one refugee camp in Cote d'Ivoire for about four years. And then they started fighting, so I had to move on to Ghana on another refugee camp where I lived for four years, so a little over eight years in total. Arrived in Canada in March 2006 as a government-sponsored refugee and Hamilton became home. That mm -hmm. was where I was brought at the yeah. time. And I settled in. Um, it wasn't easy, especially coming by myself without any family. Mm -hmm. So I found myself in a category all by myself that I had to actually deal with. But there's one thing I can say that despite all the difficulties and all the challenges I had to go through, there was never a shortage of support in the community or else I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, I've been here ever since, had the chance to go to McMaster the same year after being in Canada for six months. Um, completed my degree in 2010. Um, prior to that, my high school was actually on a refugee camp, so my grade 11 and 12 was not in the school system. It was just on the refugee camp. And ever since, I said one thing to myself, when I was on those refugee camps, there were people who knew me from nowhere that put their lives on the line for me to survive. And I mean literally put their lives on the line for mm -hmm. me to survive. And the one thing I've always hoped for, that I will be in a position also to be able to do something for a young person to find some hope and success in this world. Way to go, way to go. Which makes coming from Winona not quite as exotic, but <laughs> <laughs> Dwayne, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, yeah. what, what brought you to do the work that you're doing. Well, I, I myself grew up in, in Stony Creek in the east end of Hamilton and um, was the um, first person in my family, an extended family really, to, uh, to go into uh, post-secondary, um, but had um, really supportive uh, family around me, including aunts and uncles and, and grandparents, uh, attended uh, McMaster University and got involved uh, sometime after that with the Boys and Girls Club. And I think it's always been a passion of mine to, to try to make sure that we're providing a really interesting mix of positive role models for young people that are growing up because that's what I attribute a lot of my success and a lot of those aspirations to. Yeah, it's fun, funny because in my life, I'm not a Boys and Girls Club guy, I'm a Y guy. And uh, from the time I was four or five, uh, my mom enrolled my brother and I at the Y downtown in Hamilton. And to this day, it's a part of what I do. And I know for sure that the experience of rubbing elbows with blue collar workers and people off the street and corporate CEOs changed and shaped who I am and opened doors of opportunity that wouldn't have been there otherwise. And I think we all, when we reflect upon what allowed us to be successful, what allowed us to dream about the power of education to open doors, inevitably it was a mentor or a great teacher or a parent or a family member who said you can do it. And, and that's what's so inspiring about this opportunity. And let me start by saying that, that this is the first major tranche for the Community Foundation. We've approved a million nine in, in new funding. Both of your organizations are partners in this endeavor. And I want you to just take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about, let's start with the Boys and Girls Club. You've been around a long time. Uh, some people, particularly in East Hamilton, know you well, but others in our broader audience may not. So talk to us about what the Boys and Girls Club is all about. 
Yeah, so the Boys and Girls Club is a not-for-profit organization that's been around actually in this city since 1948. Um, a lot of people might be familiar with our main location, the Kiwanis Boys and Girls Club on Ellis Avenue down near mm -hmm. the Center Mall, um, but they may not know that we actually operate programs every day in more than 30 different locations across the city, so including uh, earlier centers and child care through to uh, youth programs and seniors programs. Uh, we're very proud uh, to support a youth-led space in the downtown core, NGEN, or the New Generation uh, yeah. Youth Center, that Leo was actually instrumental in and getting off the ground and, and the doors open and running there. So uh, it's tremendous partnerships within the community. And education has also been a really key component to what we do. And again, a lot of people may see um, physical activity programs like uh, basketball programs or the Skate the Dream program that we uh, partner mm -hmm. with the city and operating down at, uh, at Eastwood Arena. Uh, but we really believe that academic success and engagement to learning is a key that's going to underpin success for life for a lot of our young people. Very good. And Leo, Empowerment Square, you're newer, yep. probably not as well known. So talk a little bit about the roots of the organization and, and what your organization is all about. A big part of it um, came from my inspiration and my experience when I got here. Uh, my first six months in Canada, I quickly noticed that um, challenges were not unique to the refugee camp. Mm -hmm. I realized quickly in our community, there were lots of young people who were either dropping out of high school or really struggling with the school system. Mm -hmm. And not just newcomer, as much as the newcomer population was, was high. Yeah. But there were youth who have been here for generations and were still facing major challenges in our school system. When I went to McMaster, I said to myself, I have a full understanding of what education can do and what it did for me as a person. Mm -hmm. And I, I quickly came to the conclusion that if there's anything we can do for any of these young people, it has to be true education. And that's when um, I, I got interested into mentoring. And mm -hmm. when I say academic mentoring, I mean helping them to find solutions to the challenges they were having and not just helping them to solve those problems in the short term. Right. And it became very um, successful from helping four Chinese kids help to speak English. Mm -hmm. There were 35 to 45 kids coming in because they thought we were educational experts doing work. Um, at the time, I didn't even have to know the subject matter. I just needed to read a book and find an answer and they mm -hmm. thought I was the hero. Yeah. Um, I did that for a while and then someone told me, you're going to get into trouble. And I said, what do you mean? They're like, you don't have insurance, you're working with vulnerable population, if something ever goes wrong. Right. And I was like, what do you mean? I just want to do stuff. But then I quickly understood why those things were very necessary. Yeah. A bunch of my friends from the university at the time told me we have to start an organization. And I said, no, I was still organizing my life at the mm -hmm. time, so I wasn't ready for that. Um, eventually, they insisted and convinced me. And in 2008, we started a non for profit solely focused on academic mentoring and access to sports and recreation. And someone said, why sports? Mm -hmm. um, we, we did a quick survey and we found out that play was number one on the list in terms of what young, young people wanted access to. Yeah. And they said jobs was second, but what it really meant was qualification right. to get good jobs. So Empowerment Square started from that um, point. And up to now, every year, we support around 150 young people, some who have either dropped out of school or are struggling in school. And the goal is to get them on a path Mm -hmm. to regain control of the academics. We support about 20 to 25 who transition from high school to post-secondary education. And we've done great work with partners. I mean, in our early years, when we did not have our own charitable status, mm -hmm. Boys and Girls Club was very instrumental actually in assisting us to provide us that kind of support. And also some of the mentoring, mm -hmm. just to know everything from doing your financials, everything from being accountable. How do you put the right policies and structures in place? Um, Duane has been a great mentor through that process. So our partnership with other older organizations in the city has been very strong and has led to our success. Very good. You know, it's interesting when the Community Foundation set out to look at educational interventions and what made a difference. We looked at them across North America and what was common was that while money mattered for many kids, especially from challenged circumstances, it wasn't as important as other things, including mentorship and extracurricular support and access to to uh, to role models. and and. I want you, Duane, to talk a little bit about the components of the programs that you're delivering. And again, we're specifically focused on, on grades six, seven, and eight kids, because we think that is a key point of departure in terms of who's headed for post-secondary or trades uh, versus who's, who's likely to fall off uh, the, uh, the escalator's success, success. Talk to me about what you're doing. 
Yeah, so this is really a tremendous opportunity for us at the Boys and Girls Club. So in addition to all of our other programs, arts and, and physical activity and, and healthy living, um, we provide um, a lot of academic support programs that are very broad-based. We provide some more targeted programming for, uh, programming for high school age students mm -hmm. uh, through our partnership actually with Rogers, the Rogers Raising the Grade program. But we were recognizing that there was a gap of some of those kids who need some more targeted support specifically in the middle school years. So in this opportunity to partner with the Community Foundation as well as uh, the tremendous research that's evolving in this field uh, came along, we recognized that this is definitely where we needed to sink some of our resource to match that as well too. So we're going to be working with young people in two very specific schools in the Crown Point neighborhood and what we're really trying to do is... Crown help Point is Gage to Kenilworth? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're looking between Gage to Kenilworth yeah. and really sort of from, from Main Street North, so yeah. in the northeast end of the city. Yeah. And we're trying to identify, uh, and, and I've been working with our partners at schools as well, um, some kids who have tremendous potential but may not have that sense of self-efficacy or they may not have a real positive sense of their own future or they may not even have any type of a roadmap or role models around them to be able to follow some of that success. So we all know the analogy of the glass being half empty or half full and we mm -hmm. recognize that all of us, including the three of us, have an empty part of our glass but what we base our success on is the full part and we're trying to help these kids understand more their strengths, the assets, what they bring to the table as well as how to apply those towards some real interests. Mm -hmm. um, we recognize that a lot of young people go to school because they have to go to school. It may not be their own choice, um, but if we can identify something that appeals to their interests, so the idea of you know lighting a fire as opposed to filling a bucket and trying mm -hmm. to focus more on engagement, we're going to be successful. So it's a very small number of young people, and our approach at the Boys and Girls Club with everything we do is we believe our expertise is on relationships and environments. So we're very good at creating positive spaces that young people want to be in, that they vote with their feet, they decide mm -hmm. to come to us and then really focusing on making sure that they're supported with a lot of different types of role models. So um, we were sharing some stories earlier about having some inspirational role models in, in, in our youth in formative years. And for these young people, we need to be bringing people into the community from uh, McMaster, from, from Mohawk, from Redeemer, from some of those partner organizations that can be um, appealing to the young people maybe because they're on the basketball team and, and can dunk a basketball but then that young person finds out from there that they're an engineering student right. or they're an English major and that there's more that goes into some of those goals for life. By the way I was on the basketball team but I couldn't dunk a basketball <laughs> just, just for the record. Um, talk to me about that stage in life and some of the risks and challenges for middle school kids in this community to even thinking of themselves as, as a, a future student at McMaster or Mohawk or Redeemer. What, what, what's happening out there? It's actually very challenging, especially given the um, demographic shakeup of our community that most people sometimes gloss over. Mm -hmm. The truth is our community has changed quite a bit right. from the last 30 years, so I mean, however long you want to go back. And we're seeing more young people coming into our community who may not have necessarily grown up here, for example, or family may not have grown up here. Yeah. And they are now facing new sets of challenges, everything from cultural barriers to the new school system they're being exposed to. And, and the, the list goes on. Yeah. And I think what's important in middle school is, like you said, it is a point at which we can begin to help them get grounded in what to expect in the next um, three, four years to come rather than waiting for them to get there and then get the shock of the reality. I will give you a quick example. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the kids that come to the program, we always have a conversation about uh, what are you contemplating on doing with mm -hmm. yourself if you finish high school? And one of them said um, she wanted to be a nurse. And we were like, great. And one of the volunteers was trying to help her understand the process of applying mm -hmm. and everything. And she was like, I don't want to go through all that. I just want to be a nurse. I don't want to have mm -hmm. to go to some university, I just, when I'm done, I just want to be a nurse, right. which meant she didn't grasp that after high school, there's a whole nother level right. that you need to deal with to become a nurse. So the reason that stage is also important for me, I think it looks like a blank slate also, mm -hmm. because they are at a point where they are just um, coming out of the fundamentals of numeracy and literacy, and they're getting to a point where they're digging a little deeper to now start to understand how specific careers may work or how they may ground themselves properly for post-secondary education. What we bring is uh, a diversity also of role models and mentors mm -hmm. to kind of help impact some of that through their day-to-day -day relationship. The McMaster Muslim Students Association, the McMaster African Students Association, mm -hmm. and the New Mega Zeta Sorority at McMaster are three groups that are responsible every year to recruit our volunteers in um, 
So everything from culture um, and similarity to language to everything is right in there. And what I've seen, I will say this, for young kids to succeed, whether in high school, post-secondary education, is not something that happens abruptly. Mm -hmm. It happens gradually, and the best opportunity we've got to make that happen is at those stages between grade six and grade eight. Because at that point, they're just becoming of themselves. They're figuring out what's, what's happening. So when we can give them the opportunity, I seriously believe once they grasp it at that level, they may face challenges later on, mm -hmm. but they will have the fortitude enough to navigate their way around it. Very good. We've got to take a short commercial break. I'm with Dwayne Dahl from the Boys and Girls Club, Leo Johnson from Empowerment Squared. We're talking about Abacus, uh, the Community Foundation's educational initiative, and we're going to be right back with more of Hamilton's Vital Signs. After a night out with your friends, not having a plan for a safe ride home can leave you in a bad spot. You could end up riding in a police car, an ambulance, or a hearse. These unplanned modes of transportation can be a costly choice and do not take you home. Your plan could include a designated driver, a taxi, or public transit. Drink responsibly, choose your ride, and have a plan for a safe ride home. Visit arrivealive.org to find out more. Hamilton Bulldogs are stepping up and speaking out on ending violence against women. As a father, a coach, and former NHL player, I ask you to be more than a bystander. And we're back. At we're back. I'm Terry Cook. You're watching Hamilton's Vital Signs. We're talking to Dwayne Dahl from the Boys and Girls Club, uh, Leo Johnson from Empowerment Squared. We're talking about the critical uh, point of change in trajectory for middle school kids, which is the focus of our abacus program. You talked a little bit about some of the demographic and economic challenges of a number of the kids that your respective organizations are working with. One of the uh, statistics that jumped out at me when I looked at uh, Northeast Hamilton neighborhoods was that in five of them, less than 3% of parents had participated in post-secondary education. So we know that that's a great predictor of, of the likelihood of kids going on and aspiring to or seeing themselves in that role. We also know, though, that that period in development um, is a critical point in terms of their brain development. And, and I, I want you to, Dwayne, touch on what we know uh, of the science in terms of what's happening to kids at this stage, what are the roles and importance of role models and mentors and some of the things that you are building into your programming. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Most people think of kids at that age and they're thinking of puberty. They're thinking of some of the physical changes, you know, growth and, and, and increased strength and all of that. They might even be thinking of, you know, sleep clocks changing and, you know, kids staying up later and being a little more difficult to wake up in the morning. But what a lot of people don't realize is most of what we know about adolescent brain development, we've actually learned just in the lifetime of this current generation of adolescents. Mm -hmm. So we recognize now that there is a dramatic spurt in brain development that starts at around the age of 12 and it actually continues on through adolescence and even into early adulthood as well too so these kids brains are under construction at all times and we need to take that into consideration as well so we need to look at how that um, feeds into the appeal of maybe risk-taking behaviors and uh, the interest in novelty and something that's different from mm -hmm. their routines and find ways to structure that into more experiential and hands-on learning opportunities rather than the rote routine and memory that unfortunately we have in, in, in a lot of the educational structures structures. But there's also a lot of social development that goes on in the brain at this time as well too. So we know that sometimes kids' peers become more important to them and, and sometimes even at the expense of relationships with parents and family. Um, but we know that we can appeal to that with the types of peers and role models that we're bringing into these programs and making sure that there's a social component to everything that we do together. There's also a lot of emotional learning. So really we're looking at social, emotional, cognitive and physical all combined in together. And there's tremendous research that's actually been latched onto by a number of our organizations that we share and do a lot of training together to structure the programs for the best possible outcomes for our young people and also to make them programs that young people want to be in. So you touched on something that I want to 
drill down on a little bit. You mentioned systems change and the ability of working with key in, uh, educational institutions. So partners in this include our, both of our school boards as well as the post-secondary institutions. Um, one of the things that is interesting in this work is the collaboration around recognizing what each of you are able to do as, as service providers and interveners in the lives of young people. But there's another piece of it, which is let's think more broadly about how the system is serving kids. And I, I'm, I'm curious, Leo, about your views about what we can do together uh, to create learning environments, whether they be at a recreation center or an after school program or a homework club or within the classroom that are more likely to fuel that sense of possibility for our students. And, and uh, lead to, to successful outcomes? Um, I think that's a very important point, actually, especially given the opportunity with Abacus. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've been very interested in when it comes to Abacus is the opportunity to have met for the first time, at least since I've been in Hamilton, working within the non-for-profit sector, mm -hmm. where we could have um, a group of organizations coming together mm -hmm. that were recipients of the Abacus grant, sitting down and say, what are you doing, what are you doing, and how can I help, or how can I benefit from what you're already doing, or you've already done? I think that's a big part of it because we all complement each other in different ways mm -hmm. and sometimes we don't realize it because we're not talking to each other right. and the kids get a fuller experience from it. Yeah. If the kids know that, oh, what Boys and Girls Club is trying to do is exactly how what Empowerment Square is trying to do but in another way, yeah. giving them another option, there's no reason why they should not see it as the same work to bring them to a wholesome adult as they develop what Boys and Girls Club do, what Empowerment Square does, and other organizations are doing. So I think that's one important aspect. But another important aspect is to also try, it helps us identify where our challenges are. For example, when kids come to Canada, mm -hmm. you get put in grades based on your age. Right. Most other countries don't. It's based on academic ability. Yeah. So you may have a grade five in grade, being put in grade nine. Yeah and you and I know exactly what's going to happen. They've yeah. been set up pretty much to actually fail. Right. But I think when we start to work closely with each other, like we do in our program, the way we structure the Abacus program, is to say, within the course of three years, how can we plug in those gaps using very interactive tools online, YouTube, our mentors creating little yeah. videos here, here and there. So I think one of the greatest opportunities we have is to recognize and, 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 and learn more about the gaps the things that we are missing by talking to each other and also bouncing ideas of and sharing research and information, especially with some of the educational institutions. Mm -hmm. They're experts at this. Right. They, they have the hard da data. They have the um, information. We as service providers, how can we benefit from some of that to yeah. be able to enrich the experience of kids? When and yet, increasingly, the school systems are saying we need the support of other parts of the community, yeah. particularly parental involvement. Yeah. and and. Uh, providers of service, funders, and, and other citizens. Y you spent some time recently on the Premier's Council looking exactly at system-wide change, and, and I'm curious about your thoughts on, um, in addition to what you're doing on the ground with individual middle school kids, where do you see the gaps and opportunities? Yeah, well, it's interesting. The, the, the work on the Premier's Council on Youth Opportunities was uh, a group of young people themselves as well as champions and advocates for, for youth that recognized that we have 17 different provincial ministries that have mandates that have impact on young people or that have programming dollars directed to them, but they weren't collaborating and they weren't all using a strength-based approach. So here in the city of Hamilton, we obviously have funds coming through some of those ministries, but we're working with, as you mentioned, our local school boards and, and, and other partner agencies within the community. So some of the change is already happening. Some of the attitudes are already changing. Some of the misconceptions of the past or the deficit model where we're assuming that kids are somehow broken and need mm -hmm. to be fixed or that right. they're a problem that needs to be solved. And we have champions both top down as well as grassroots up with you know some tremendous teachers and, and, and champions on the ground that are recognizing the potential of young people and not just looking at trying to get them to be problem free, but trying to make sure that they're actually thriving. Uh, I'm thrilled that uh, my opportunity to get to know both of the directors of education of our major school boards in the city was through their time as principals in East End schools right. and sometimes some challenging circumstances where I recognized that these were some of those champions that are now in positions to be able to help support the great work that, that ourselves and, and our partners are doing in, here in the community. Yeah, and I, I've got to say, I, I often take the opportunity to cite great leadership within the system and obviously great principals and great teachers make a difference. But having Dave Hansen at the Catholic Board and Manny Figueroa at the Public Board as 
folks who have lived and breathed the experience of what a great educator can do uh, for us in this community is a, is a huge benefit and a, and, a, and a couple of very important allies. We've only got a couple of minutes left. I, 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 wanna, I wanna personalize this a little bit because in each of your lives and in the work that you do, uh, you've had the opportunity to, to change uh, the future for young people. And I want you to just take a minute or two and tell us about one individual experience that you've had where education has in fact made a difference. Um, I, was, I would go first with um, one of our youth who walked into the program in 2008 mm -hmm. at Empowerment Square. He was in grade nine as a Johnny at the time. Mm -hmm. Couldn't speak a word of English. Had just come and was very sure that he was just in the school to kill the time until mm -hmm. he actually dropped off. He came to Empowerment Square because he wanted to play soccer. He was not interested in anything else. But you had to come to the academic program to be able to access right. soccer. If you didn't come, you would not play. Yep. So he would come and torture himself for the two hours there and then go play soccer. And we worked with him over the years and I was very impressed that um, two months ago he came back to me. He successfully graduated as a psychiatric nurse and he now works at St. Joseph Hospital. And he was the keynote speaker for our year and an event to talk about how the program was really the foundation, laid down the foundation that allowed him to complete high school, to go to, to a university and complete his, his, his program. But personally, I will end with myself. I came to this country in 2006 with just the clothes on my back. Mm -hmm. I connected with people, I went to school, and because of that opportunity to be educated, today I sit here and mm -hmm. I'm in a position that, that I'm not just able to take care of myself mm -hmm. and my family back in Liberia, yeah. I'm able to also support a lot of young people in this community. And we've taken that to another step that even in our advocacy program, we've built in what we call the school readiness program for Syrian youth. There's a lot going on for the adults, not a lot of attention is being paid to the trajectory that young people will go on. So we'll be looking at supporting 50 Syrian youth over the coming months for school readiness so that by the time September hits, they are not shocked to the system. So again, I believe if we're going to do anything for young people, education has to be at the forefront. And thanks to Abacus for giving us this opportunity. Great stuff. One story. Yeah, well, it, it, it's tough. We've had so many great successes, and every story is, is different. But I'm going to talk about a young person that actually made a lot of really poor choices when he was young and wasn't heavily involved in, in, in our programs initially, but got connected to us when he actually was a young person and, and, and had to do community service work. Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting for him because it was the first time in his life that people were asking what he was interested in doing and what he wanted to get out of the experience. He just thought this was punishment and something that he had to do. So by providing opportunities for his own personal growth, he started to care about the growth of other people around. And we started to realize that he had a lot of leadership potential. So he still wasn't a stellar student through high school, but did enough so that he was able to graduate and had some options available. And we always tell our young people that options is really our definition of success. Everybody doesn't have to go on to college or university or whatever program it is, but if you're able to complete high school, you have those options available to you. Um, this person ended up taking their options as well as some scholarships that we were able to connect the, the, uh, this individual to. Um, we provide scholarships through our own organization as well as connected through Boys and Girls Subs of Canada. And through his success in post-secondary, he's actually gone on to be successful in business. I hate to say it's in Toronto as opposed to here in Hamilton. <laughs> okay. But he's also a leader in the arts community. And for, with that hat on, he continues to come back and act as a role model and a mentor, not just within Boys and Girls Club programs, but broadly here in the community as well. And he credits not the Boys and Girls Club with providing his talent or, or his ambition, but with opening the door so that he had a different sense of his own life, a different sense of his future, and also realized that what he thought about himself was really driven to a large extent on the impact that he could have on other people and those who are following in his footsteps quite specifically. Gotta love it. And on that note, we are out of time. Thank you to Dwayne Dahl and the Boys and Girls Club, Leo Johnson and Empowerment Squared for the work that you're doing, for your partnership with Abacus and the Community Foundation. Together we are going to make a difference and we appreciate so much the difference you're making in the lives of young students in Hamilton. I'm Terry Cook. You've been watching Hamilton's Vital Signs. As always, you can follow us on Twitter or Facebook. We look forward to being with you again next month. Take care.